thank you all the attendees, the speakers, the speaker, and um, uh, we are very happy to have all you guys here today to uh, listen and the talk and chatting to Professor uh, Patrice Simon from Université Paul Sabetier. Patrice Simon is one of the greatest mind on the 21th century. He has more than um, uh, 50, uh, 56,000 citation, the eight score index, eight one. Uh, it's a great pleasure to all of us to have Professor Simon, Simon with us today. We read Professor Simon's work on material science, um, uh, where he uh, talked about um, um, a chemistry of materials and use uh, in situ electrochemistry or operando, uh, several types of operando measurements, analysis, for example, NMR or other, others to, uh, um, to present a, a, a mechanism, uh, to propose a mechanism to describe electrodes, energy storage process, and to make um, um, this, this device and this electrode electrified interface more understandable for uh, most of us. He also used uh, on, the, on his team, of course, uh, a simulation modeling to, 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 to make all this story. So Professor Simon have received several, several awards, and uh, that's a great pleasure today because we are going to receive the gift, and the gift is uh, to listen and have opportunity to chat with Professor Simon at the end. So, Professor Simon, thank you once again to find the time to be with us today. It's a great pleasure uh, to have you here, and the, the word's all yours. Thank you very much. Go for it. Thanks a lot uh, for the very kind introduction. Uh, it's a bit maybe uh, too enthusiastic, but anyway, th th thanks a lot. Uh, deeply appreciate it. So can you hear me quite well? Yep. Okay, great. So uh, I would like to thank uh, uh, for, for, for the invitation because it's really my pleasure to give this talk today. So good morning uh, to, uh, uh, to you because uh, in Brazil, I guess this is morning. So this is uh, afternoon in France. Um, so. As it was mentioned, I'm going to talk about the electrochemistry at the nanoscale, and I will make a specific focus on materials for energy storage applications. And um, I'm going to try to show you what we are currently doing in the lab. Um, to uh, uh, oh, I'm going to put a pointer. Okay, so this is a Ragoni plot where you see the I will say the power specific power of the specific energy of different energy storage devices, and you can see that batteries are like marathoners with high specific energy density and low specific powers and the time constant ranges from tens of minutes to hours and on the other hand of the spectra you have these electrochemical capacitors which are high power here devices but with limited energy density uh, with a, i would say a kind of plateau today at about 10 15 watt hour per kilogram so 20 times less energy density compared to batteries, to lithium ion batteries. And the first message is that, uh, uh, as you can see from this performance, batteries and electrochemical capacitors, which are also called supercapacitors, are complementary devices. And the uh, ratio of the energy to power. Sorry, sorry. sorry to interrupt, interrupt you, but uh, we are not watching uh, the um, Hagon plot right now. So we are seeing. Oh, really? just, yeah, sorry. Sorry to say this. Okay, but, yeah. I'm going to try to, to share again. Mm -mm -mm. Can you see? Can you see here the Ragoni plot or not? Y yes, right now it's working. Thank you very much. Okay, so just let me know. Okay, fine. If I change with the slide, you see it? I changed no, the slide. Maybe. No, just say uh, just watching the number two. So maybe you should go for a presentation yeah. mode. Sorry, sorry, Dr. Patrice. When you put it in presentation mode, yeah, it uh, it just stops to to move the slides. I recommend you to share the entire screen and not only the application. Um, okay. Screen sharing. Share the screen. Share 
the entire screen okay authorize yeah okay so i'm gonna do that here okay if okay, i change now it's good mine. now it's good okay great sorry about that thank you so yeah so batteries and super caps basically are complementary um i will say and last point is that the time constant of uh, super caps is about i will say a uh, few seconds to a few tens of seconds to a couple of minutes no more uh, just because uh, uh, of uh, uh, limited uh, energy density. Okay, now what we are doing at the lab, we are working with two uh, on, on two different uh, aspects. The first one is to increase the energy density of electrochemical capacitors to try to reach this uh, yellow star here. And to do that, uh, we try to increase the capacitance and we try to understand uh, the ion transfer, ion absorption in nano-sized carbon pores. And I'm going to show you examples of uh, what we are doing here. And also, uh, we try to tackle the issue from the other side, starting from batteries and try to increase the specific power of batteries to, uh, uh, again, improve the performance. And uh, what we try to do is to uh, design materials with high redox reaction rates in the bulk of the materials to try to design non-diffusion limited redox reactions. And I will give you a couple of examples on that as well. So the first part is going to be focused on uh, carbon-based electrochemical double-layer capacitors. So just a reminder, uh, EDLC, there is no redox reactions. The charge is stored by ion adsorption onto high-surface uh, porous carbon. So basically, you have two porous carbon electrodes with electrolyte in between. And when you polarize the electrode, this electrode is positive, this one is negative. The counter ion adsorption uh, occurs onto, uh, onto the electrode. This is a modeling from Celine Merle here. You can see a uh, positive, uh, sorry, porous carbon electrode, the second porous carbon electrode, the electrolyte with uh, cations in red and anions in green. And when you polarize, you, uh, you uh, ions are entering the carbon pores and you store the charge electrostatically by charging the double layer capacitance and you charge the double layer capacitance, which is proportional to the dielectric constant of the electrolyte, uh, multiplied by the surface area of, uh, of the porous carbon, of, I would say, the electrochemical, electrochemically active carbon electrolyte surface area, divided by the approaching distance of the ion to the carbon surface. And then at the end, you end up with 10 to 20 microfarad per square centimeter of double layer capacitance for conventional porous carbons. However, now uh, the question is how this electrical double layer charging uh, is achieved in confined nanopores. And before uh, trying to go in, in, the, in the depth of the science, I'm going to give you some basic reminders about the electrical double layer at first planar 2d metallic electrode so the first model is the helmholtz model which state in a kind of linear electrostatic potential drop within the helmholtz layer which is constituted by the counter ion adsorption from the electrolyte electrolyte side here to balance a positive charge you inject into a carbon and the double layer capacitance with the Helmholtz capacitance, which is the one I just mentioned before. However, you have uh, two drawbacks. First is that the surface excess charge that you put in the metallic electrode or conducting electrode may not be counterbalanced by the Helmholtz layer when you use low concentrated electrolytes. And the second point is that counter ion layer is not static because of the ion movement. So to try to tackle this issue, uh, Guy Chapman came to, uh, with a, a, a diffuse layer model. So in fact, what you have is that you balance, you screen the electrode charge within the diff finite distance lambda d, which is a Debye length, uh, within the finite distance in the electrolyte. And then you, uh, you, 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 you can calculate the capacitance for this, what we call diffuse layer. And this capacitance changes as a hyperbolic cosine. Uh, and then this, you can see uh, this diffuse layer as a distance from the electrode to the bulk of the electrolyte where the electrode charge is fully screened. So if you plot the change of the capacitance versus the potential, you see that you have a kind of a hyperbolic change, but you have, again, two different problems. The hyperbolic shape disappears for high concentration uh, electrolyte and the second point is that all the experimental 
double uh, Wishapman capacitance were much less than the calculated one, predicted one by the model. This is just because, in fact, in this model, Wishapman model, there is nothing to prevent ions to uh, approach the electrode surface unlimitedly. So it means that the capacitance at the contact point should be infinite. And this is why this model was not uh, as some drawback. And then finally, to unify all these two models, Stern came by considering the first inner layer of Helmholtz, uh, I would say, capacitance, together with a diffuse layer to uh, uh, depict the ion adsorption on electrochemical uh, double layer. And if you use this uh, Guy Chapman Stern model, then you see that you have a kind of finite capacitance at high potential, and then you still preserve this hyperbolic shape, and you are you fit much better the experimental plots. So you can see this uh, double layer capacitance as a, uh, as a series, uh, as two, with two capacitance in series, one with uh, Mol's capacitance and second one by the Guish, with the Guy Chapman. However, if you use concentrated electrolytes like we do in uh, energy storage devices, obviously lambda d, the Dubai length, tends to zero because there is no diffuse layer if the electrolyte is super concentrated. So that finally at the end, your double layer capacitance is more or less the Helmholtz capacitance. And this is what we will consider uh, uh, in the next uh, slides. So um, to study the ion adsorption in porous carbons, you need porous carbons. And what we use as, as uh, porous carbons are carbide derivative carbons, which are model materials for our studies. We are not only using these ones, but I will give you a couple of examples of what we do later. To prepare this uh, TIC, I mean, with CDC, carbide derivative carbon, porous carbons from uh, metal carbide, we take a TIC powder and we do a chlorination of this TIC powder at different temperatures so that you remove a titanium part through gas phase and you end up with carbons which are porous. And these are <clears throat> some examples of the porous volume versus the pore size. It's pore size distribution for carbons, CDC prepared at different temperatures. If you do the chlorination at 600 degrees, you prepare, you see you have a very nice uh, narrow distribution at 0.74 Armstrong pore size. Uh, nanometers uh, per size. And if you uh, use uh, 800 Celsius degrees, then you have a, a mean average per size of 0.8 nanometers. So we prepare like that a series of model materials with a very narrow pore size distribution to understand how ions are going in and out of these pores. And what we have shown with these materials is that when you, uh, when you use carbon pores with a size less than the, I would say, uh, solvated ion size, you force ion to partially dissolvate to enter the spores, and then when you confine ion in the spores, you have a big capacitance increase. So <clears throat> to now to, to try to go a little bit further, you need to design, uh, you need advanced tools to understand the ion adsorption in this uh, super, I mean, in this confined small pore size materials. I'm going to show you examples of the first, uh, first technique we are using, which is EQCM, quartz, electrochemical quark crystal microbalance. So this is, uh, the idea is to try to have an experiment, uh, experimental confirmation of dissolvation of ions when entering small pore size. So what you do is that you take a <clears throat> piezoelectric quartz with a resonance uh, frequency and you coat this quartz with, uh, I will say, uh, uh, porous carbon mixed with a binder. Then you're going to use these quartz as a working electron in a conventional uh, working electron in conventional free electrode cell. And during the experiment, you are going to polarize your uh, material uh, positively, negatively. And during the experiment, you record the change of a quartz resonance quartz frequency. And <coughs> sorry. <coughs> and as long as you have a weight change on your electrode, then the resonance frequency is changing. And you can correlate the change of delta F, the resonance frequency, with the change of the weight of, a of the electrode through the Sorabray equation. So it means that if you plot <coughs> cyclic voltammetry, you polarize your carbon, and in operando, you can record the change of uh, frequency resonance 
And as long as the frequency resonance, if you are in a gravimetric mode, which is a bit uh, tricky to be, not tricky, but you have to be really careful to be in a gravimetric mode because the change of viscoelastic properties of the electrolyte, or your electrode, can also lead to a change of resonance frequency. So you have to uh, really un understand what you are doing. But so once that said, in, when you are in a gravimetric mode, then you can record the change of the frequency during the polarization, and you can transform this change of frequency by change, weight change of the electrode. If you divide by the charge, which is obtained from the integration of cyclic voltammetry, Faraday's law tells you that <coughs> the charge of the weight divided by the charge is proportional to the molar weight of the species which are entering in uh, the small poles. So this is how we we uh, we try to understand what happens in this pole. So the first electrolyte we use is uh, ethyl methyl imidazolium trifluorosulfonide imide uh, salt EMI TFSI dissolved in acetonitrile uh, two mole per liter of EMI TFSI. And <clears throat> so we put carbon onto the quartz. And the first thing that we do, we record the cyclic voltammetry. So this is open circuit potential. This is the current versus potential. This is open circuit potential. And here you see we polarize negatively. And then we go back to the open circuit potential. What you see is that we have more or less a rectangular shape cyclic voltammetry. This is typical from a capacitive uh, storage. It means that a rectangular cyclic voltammetry is typical from ion adsorption desorption with no redox reaction. Why? Because the uh, Q is C multiplied by V. So C is I divided by DE over DT. And D over DT is the potential scan rate. So when the potential scan rate is constant like here, if you assume that your double layer capacitance is constant, then you have a constant current. And you see you go to more or less constant current here and constant current here. And then you have here a slight change of current because there is a kind of electrosorption uh, driven process. But anyway, we have capacitive signature. And this is here the change of resonance frequency of the quartz recorded during the cyclic voltammetry. And you see that you have a frequency change. Same applies when you start from open circuit potential to positive potential. So you have a capacitive like signature with a weight change, uh, a frequency change, sorry, of a quartz corresponding to a weight change because anions and cations are going in and out. Uh, during the polarization. From this cyclic voltammetry, you can calculate the charge and then you can transform the frequency in weight change. And then you can plot the weight change of the electrode versus the charge. So this is for negative polarization, negative charge, and this is the experimental weight change. As I told you before, the slope of uh, delta M divided by, uh, versus delta Q is a Faraday's law. So if you assume that when you inject negative electrons, uh, negative charge, sorry, into your electrode during negative polarization, if you assume that these electrons on the carbon side are balanced by adsorption of neat EMI plus, the molar weight is 111 gram per mole for EMI plus, then you should end up with this here uh, slope. As you can see, the experimental slope is higher. So it means that we have more heavier uh, uh, ions which are adsorbed, cations adsorbed into our porous carbon. How can you explain that? You just explain that because our cations are entering the carbon pores with solvation share, with solvent molecules. And you, calcul you can calculate from experimental uh, to uh, uh, theoretical weight you can calculate that cations, EMI cations, enters with 3.6 acetonitrile molecules into our porous carbon, which I forgot to mention is one nanometer pore size. So we have carbon pores, we have pores of one nanometer pore size. And uh, during polarization and during negative polarization, cations enter with three to four solvent molecules. Knowing that cations are surrounded by eight solvent, more solvent molecules in the bulk, then we can say that this is an experimental evidence of partial dissolvation. Then when you positive, when we polarize, sorry, positively, what do we see? We see something like that. You see there is a zone here where the slope, 
experimental slope is less than the theoretical one, which corresponds to the neat TFSI minus. How do you explain that? You explain it very simply. When you inject a whole positive charge in the carbon, in fact, a part of cations are leaving the carbon surface and some anions are entering the carbon surface. So this is why you have an ion exchange mechanism at medium charge here in this zone before moving back to full anion adsorption. So these results show first uh, ion dissolvation. Uh, it was the first experimental evidence of ion dissolvation here. And second, it shows that you charge, there is a different charge storage mechanism uh, when you charge uh, this pose carbon into uh, non aqueous electrolyte. So to try to understand uh, why we have such difference in charge storage mechanism from counter ion adsorption to ion exchange and dissolution and blah, 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 we try to uh, make a state back by trying to understand what happens onto single graphene layer. And what we did was to, to, to prepare uh, SLG from uh, uh, CVD ground onto copper. Then you etch the copper, you transfer the graphene, single layer graphene onto polyethylene film. And then you transfer by pressing your graphene onto your gold quartz, you dissolve the PET, and then you have a gold quartz coated with graphene. We use the same setup, electrochemical uh, quartz crystal microbalance. And this is optical image of a, a gold crystal, gold quartz, sorry, coated with uh, graphene, single layer graphene. There are some slight 20, 15% of uncoated gold zones. But we see from the Raman spectroscopy results that we have a, a, a p dupped uh, graphene layer signature, which is normal because we have a gold below uh, in contact with Raman, with uh, SNG. And the AFM shows some uh, wrinkles about 0.8 nanometers, but anyway, uh, 80 to 90 percent of the quartz is coated with graphene. And this is a cyclic voltammetry. We uh, run first without uh, recording the, the weight change. Cyclic voltammetry of a bare gold, uh, bare gold uh, quartz, and the quartz coated with single layer graphene. First in neat EMI TFSI electrolyte. There is no more solvent first, only EMI TFSI at room temperature. So you see that we did not expect a, a big change in the cyclic voltammetry because it's single layer graphene, but we have a, a change in the CV and uh, you don't see the here the uh, strong, uh, uh, strong uh, uh, chemical adsorption here on the gold so that yes, we have a single layer graphene onto our gold quartz. And what we did next was to measure the differential capacitance uh, at different potentials <coughs> uh, on for, for of our SLG in EMI TFSI electrolyte. So we did it by uh, electrochemical impedance spectroscopy measurements and to extract the true capacitance, we use a mathematical model uh, that we developed uh, years ago to uh, uh, calculate the real part of the capacitance, which can be obtained from uh, the impedance data. It's basically the slope uh, at low frequency, but not only. And then you can plot the change of a double layer capacitance, I would say the layer, the interfacial capacitance versus the potential. What you see is that we have a V-shaped capacitance change, a butterfly shape. And this butterfly shape in the literature was explained by several different uh, theories. First one, People say the claim that this butterfly shape observed with, for instance, carbon nanotube corresponds to a minimum of conductivity of the carbon nanotubes. Other people, more recently in uh, Nature Nanotechnology, this is uh, Professor Zhu work in uh, uh, Hefei University, they explain this butterfly, sh they, uh, butterfly shape, this V-shape uh, capacitance change with the existence of a space charge region driven by the quantum capacitance of the single layer graphene, which is in fact here from their uh, uh, view, uh, linked with a limited number of charge carrier uh, density on the single graphene layer. And other people mentioned that you have strong correlations between ions and carbon surface. So then in this case, this could explain also this uh, specific behavior. So the idea is to try to understand uh, where does this specific behavior come from? Only electrolytes, 
only graphene or interactions between graphene and electrolyte. And first, what we did was to record the change of with a change of a frequency, resonance frequency, with during the polarization. And then we transform, as I mentioned before, into weight change versus the charge. So this is the same single layer graphene in EMI if they sign it. What you see is that when you start from PCC, you go to positive polarization, you have weight loss. Weight loss means that you disorb something. You disorb a positive, mainly positive charge. And we found that the slope corresponds to a kind of cluster, which is uh, EMI 1.6, TFSI, uh, I will say 0 0.55, 56, um, 58, sorry, uh, cation. So it's a cluster with a net charge of one. So this could be the case because in uh, neat EMI TFSI, there is no solvent to screen the interactions between the ions. And what is also very interesting is that for negative polarization, there is no weight change. It's, there is no net ion flux in and out from in or out from the single layer graphene. However, if you remember exactly what I there is still a capacitive charge storage mechanism. So what we uh, propose is that, or what we, this, this shows that uh, you have a storage mechanism, but no net ion flux. Model, modelization told us that, in fact, when you inject negative charge onto the graphene, what you see is that you have your EMI plus cations that can change their orientation from perpendicular, I mean, from a, from a vertical orientation to a surface, carbon surface, to a parallel orientation to a carbon surface when you increase the negative charge density. And this is a very interesting result because it shows that you can uh, charge, you can store the charge by simple electrolyte ion reorganization. No need to have an X-flux of ions. So beyond these interesting results, it shows that this can be used as a platform, single layer graphene, EQCM, electrolyte, to study the electrolyte carbon interactions. And this is what we continue to do uh, recently. And I'm going to show you now results with EMI TFSI dissolved in acetonitrile. So the same thing, except that we added some solvents into uh, the uh, EMI plus. And this is uh, the change of a capacitance, interfacial capacitance, for what we just saw uh, the EMI TFSI needs, the V-shape plot I presented, the same for EMI TFSI, two mole per liter in acetonitrile electrolyte. And here, this is the neat gold quartz. What you see first is that the minimum, which corresponds to the PZC, the potential of zero charge, this minimum is shifted from positive, from the, uh, I would say negative to positive potential values when you add solvent. What does it mean? It means that simply you decrease the EMI plus cation graphene layer interactions just because you add solvent. You, if you remember what I just mentioned before, you have a strong interactions between the cations and the single layer graphene in neat EMI TFSI. And this strong interaction was responsible for just a charge storage mechanism by ion orientation onto the uh, graphene surface during negative polarization. Here, you decrease the ion ion interaction because there is a solvent to screen this interaction, and then you decrease the carbon cation interaction. You shift the PCC to positive value. And the bare gold, which is the double layer capacitance, there is no change of a double layer capacitance if you want to use a bare gold electrode. So the interfacial capacitance can be viewed as a, a Capacitance, which are which are we, we are going to call a charge space charge capacitance in series with a double layer capacitance, and if we take the der derivative of this uh, capacitance, interfacial capacitance, this is a Machotsky plot. So one divided by c is one divided by c space charge, and if you take the derivative, you end up with this region, which is a, a flat band potential and the potential, and then from the slope you can estimate <coughs> the charge carrier density. So this is a slow, this is a plot one divided by c square versus uh, e minus uh, v minus vb or e minus epcc. 
And what you see is that <coughs> uh, for uh, both, I will say, uh, in both case, whatever solvents or not solvents, you see that you have a maximum, and then you move from an N-type to a P-type behavior in both electrolytes, solventry or not solventry. And obviously for gold, there is no change of slope because it's a constant capacitance. But, okay, then you can calculate from these plots a kind of uh, charge carrier density. But this space charge reason, region, this space charge, because you have, uh, the charge carrier density correspond to a volume, it's number of uh, uh, carrier per cubic centimeter. We have a 2D material. However, if you remember, we said that we have a strong interactions between the cation and the SLG surface. So in fact, this could be assumed as a gram-like model with specifically absorbed ions. And in that case, this is the cation. And this will be here, the space charge region. And this space charge region depends obviously from both the SLG and the electrolyte. And this space charge region is defined by the thickness, which includes the adsorbed EMI plus ions. And if we go a little bit further, uh, from these slopes, we can calculate a charge carrier density of 10 to the power 23 carrier per cubic centimeter. In neat ionic liquid, here, more or less for positive and negative polarization. So which means that if you consider uh, the by length of one nanometer, which is more or less what we assume to be uh, uh, the screening, uh, sorry, the space charge region when you have big EMI plus ions strongly absorbed onto it, then you end up to a charge carrier density of 10 to the power 14 per square centimeter, which is really consistent with previous value into, into, into literatures. So when you move to from EMI TFSI to EMI TFSI in acetonitrile, you have more or less the same charge carrier density for positive polarization, the same slope here between the red and the blue for positive. However, for negative polarization, still considering that you have uh, this uh, uh, the much shot key model, you see that you increase the charge carrier density to 10 to power 24 per cubic centimeter. Why? Because it was 10 to power 23, just because in fact, when you add solvent, you decrease the Dubai length because there is no more charge over screening and because there is no more uh, strong ion correlation uh, between the uh, uh, ionic uh, liquid ions. And then, as a conclusion, the capacitance, interfacial capacitance, is directly correlated with this space charge capacitance and it depends on both the single layer graphene and the electrolyte. It's a joint discussion exchange between graphene and ionic uh, liquids and uh, electrolyte. Then we, we did some, uh, I would say, gravimetric experiment. And you can see here the change of the weight versus uh, the charge. And what you see, a striking difference here is that, remember, what, uh, the, you have here on positive charge, a very linear slope, which, is corresponds, which corresponds to anion adsorption. And on the ne negative side, a linear slope which corresponds to cation adsorption. And we have more or less cations and anions adsorbed with one and two acetonitrile molecules. And here, what you see is that uh, if you remember what we presented, I presented before in EMI TFSI NEAT, it was a completely different behavior here and uh, with a, a weight loss for positive polarization, no weight change during negative polarization, so completely different behavior. And we just simply change the screening, uh, we change the pi-pi interactions, be, 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 because in neat EMI, TFSI, the strong interactions between EMI and graphene comes mainly from pi-pi interactions between the EMI plus and the sp2 carbon, but also alkyl chain interactions. And just by adding the solvent, by screening these pi pi interactions, we completely change the charge storage mechanism. And now, if we compare the SLG in two mol per liter EMI TFSI in acetonitrile with 3D porous carbon in the same electrolyte, you can see that still we have a difference in the electrochemical behavior because 
the charge storage also changes still very really nice charge storage for cations but here now we have this huge for porous 3d carbon huge ion exchange zone that we don't see anymore uh, clearly here on the graphene side so what it means it means finally that not only the pore size is important for capacitance but also the local carbon structure and this carbon structure has an impact on the charge storage mechanism okay so this was the first part where i tried to to show you that uh, uh yeah this is a uh, uh, you can you can try to uh, uh, design experiments to try to get information that looks super local scale to try to understand how ions are moving in and out from the pores and try to uh, make a correlation between this super local uh, charge storage mechanism together with a macroscopic uh, uh, ion uh, uh, storage mechanism with capacitance and so on. So this is quite, uh, I would say, interesting and exciting. But the second part of my talk as I mentioned before, it's going to be dedicated to increase the power density of redox-based mechanism uh, re materials by using non-diffusion limited redox reactions. So, just to come back on different uh, some basic definitions. So, double layer I just mentioned electrostatic uh, adsorption, cyclic voltammetry is rectangular, and the current plateau is proportional to the square root to the sorry to the uh, potential scan rate, and there is no diffusion limitation. Low capacity, high power. If you move to uh, redox materials like battery materials, this is the example of uh, Li FAPO4, FAPO4 redox couple. So this is LFP. Here, this is oxidation of LFP, removal of lithium, intercalation of lithium into FP. When you can see you have a sharp redox peaks and you have a peak dec current decrease because of a diffusion limitation. And this peak current here, on both sides is proportional thanks to the render specific equation to the square root of the scan rate. So this is a typical signature of diffusion limited processes. And uh, this is a, 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 the galvanostatic, not so, so, some cyclic voltammetry, but just for your uh, knowledge, just for galvanostatic, uh, what you see, a sloping profile for capacity and a, I would say plateau for a redox two phase material. Okay. Now, uh, if we go back to the basics, uh, Brian Conway uh, reported the uh, what he called adsorption pseudo capacitance. So, if you when you adsorb uh, cations onto a metal, you form uh, adsorbed cation onto the metal, and you can describe this adsorption by using a Langmuir type electrosorption model where theta is the surface coverage, which is uh, which follows an Arrhenius law with voltage here, and then you go back to a potential which depends on theta, which is again the surface coverage, and you calculate a cap you can cal calculate uh, an adsorption pseudo capacitance because you have an electron transfer pseudo capacitance for a monolayer, which is given by QF divided by RT uh, versus theta. Okay. Now, if you plot, sorry, oops. Mm -hmm. Okay, sorry, it was blocked. Uh, from this very basic Frank, uh, Frank uh, language, sorry, model, you can implement a little bit the model by considering a lateral interaction parameter J, moving to the so-called Franking type electrosorption process. And this J parameter is going, in fact, to modify your uh, capacitance and theta coverage. So this is here the change of the coverage parameter surface coverage theta versus the potential. And this is in black here, the change of a pseudo capacitance here, taking into account uh, the G parameter for G is zero means a Langmuir type model. You have a potential dependent, I would say pseudo capacitance with a very uh, well marked pronounced uh, maximum at potential. However, when you consider uh, a change in the G value, for instance, if you put G as positive, which means repulsive interactions between the adsorbates, so they force to, uh, to, uh, to get uh, far to each other, then you smooth here the potential dependence uh, of uh, capacitance. Okay, so 
Stochocapacitance, this adsorption of stochocapacitance tends to be less potential dependent when you integrate a kind of positive interaction parameter. And Conway generalizes this concept, this approach, to 3D materials, and he proposed the concept of pseudocapacitance. This is the first example. This is a lithium plus intercalation in TIS2. This is the equation in non aqueous electrolyte, and this is the change of a potential here versus the number of lithium in TIS2. And end up with this kind of uh, uh, equation versus uh, equation to depict this intercalation, where you replace theta, in fact, in the previous equation that we saw, with x here, x being being the number of lithium into TIS2. And you can see that if you use this kind of uh, a change of potential with x, you depict more or less this, I would say, sigmoid uh, change of a potential with a number of lithium. So you also, he also added a kind of lateral interaction parameter, which is dependent for the, uh, the G parameter that we saw before, and the internal pressure, P, which was, in fact, the pressure when you add lithium into a structure, the internal pressure increasing. But the key message is that you can depict the intercalation of lithium in TIS2 using a subsion isotherm model, and this led to the concept of pseudocapacitance. And then another example is ruthenium oxide and sulfuric acid electrolyte. You can see that more or less, you have a very nice rectangular CV with redox bumps here. This CV is redox. This CV is not capacitive in the way that is not double layer. It's a redox process where ruthenium oxidation state changes with proton intercalation. And what you see, in fact, is that this uh, pseudocapacitance is explained by the overlapping of different redox processes ruthenium 4, 3, 2, and this overlap gives you this envelope here where now the, uh, I will say, pseudocapacitance is constant with the potential. So the key feature for pseudocapacitance is a constant change of Q versus V, no phase change. It's, again, uh, it's a one-phase system. It's a continuous intercalation or redox intercalation uh, of... Uh, uh, cation uh, uh, in, in the material or a continuous change in the redox state of the material and there is no diffusion limitation. So this uh, surface redox capacitance uh, again is, uh, is this one and you have to keep in mind that you end up with mirror image CVs with these uh, uh, materials. And now we move, I move to a, a Maxine as for after this introduction. Why Muxin? Because Muxin are two-dimensional materials pioneered by Gogolsi and Barzum's group. Uh, and these are 2D materials with highly accessible surface area. And uh, you start to prepare a Muxin, you start from max MAX phase. One of the most popular is M is titanium, A is aluminum, X is carbon. Because in these, uh, these materials, uh, X is a carbon and nitrogen, and M an early transition metal, and A a valve metal. So TI3-ALC2, you start from this material, and you're going to etch this material in fluorhydric acid or fluorine containing acidic electrolyte, typically lithium fluoride in HCl. By doing that, through fluorine, you etch the aluminum layer. And when you etch aluminum layer, you end up with these 2D materials with Van der, Waals, uh, uh, Van der Waals gaps in between. However, you have to keep in mind that now you, uh, you obtain a TI3C2 material or 2D material with surface groups onto a surface. These surface groups come from the etching process. When you have fluorine, you, and, uh, you, you, you end up with materials with high fluorine content onto the surface and OH groups. Never mind, these materials, uh, we published a paper a couple of years ago, are solo capacitive in sulfuric acid, so they can uh, promote a fast proton intercalation when you inject electrons, and you change redox state of the titanium between titanium-3 down to titanium-2. And what we did first with uh, Professor Zifang Lin, which is now, who is now a professor in, uh, Shishuan, at Sichuan University, we try to design muxin material, TI3C2, pre-intercalated with sulfuric acid. Why? To increase the surface area between the electrolyte and 
the muxine, to maximize the contact between the electrolyte and the muxine. So we started from colloidal suspension of TI3C2. We did a filtration. And then this was a more or less a sketch of the electrode after that. You have water molecules in between the muxine layer. We put this in sulfuric acid electrolyte. Little by little, sulfuric acid goes between the layers and water diffused back into the sulfuric acid electrolyte. Then we dried and we obtain, we plan to obtain, uh, I would say, uh, pre intercalated uh, TI3C2 materials with H2SO4 electrolyte. And when you when you see your electrode, this is a filtered electrode, so this is very thin, flexible, and then you start from uh, the max phase here, TI3LC2. This is the delaminated, uh, sorry, this is the muxine, so you can see that the 0, 0 to peak is shifted to a negative to a lower angle so that you increase the uh, uh, displacing and then uh, when you put back sulfuric acid into it then you shift a little bit more because you increase the interior spacing after the pre-intercalation of sulfuric acid so everything is fine and now when you test this material in sulfuric acid you can see that this is cyclic voltammetry you have a kind of uh, very symmetric cyclic voltammetry with surface redox here, symmetric peaks, and you can reach super high potential scan rate. And first, uh, what you see is that the capacitance, volumetric capacitance, is super high, 1500 farad per cubic centimeter. And even if you have a, a decent weight loading of 1.5 milligram per square centimeter, you can still reach uh, close to one volt per second and at uh, 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 700 millivolt per second, you still get 500 farad per cubic centimeter. If you decrease a little bit to 0.6 milligram per, per square centimeter, you can get 800 farad per cubic centimeter at one volt per second, which is super high. Same in farads per gram, you have very high gravimetric capacitance, even for decent weight loaded electrode. Uh, so finally, when you use your muxine with pre-interpolated muxines in sulfuric acid electrolyte, you end up with super high volumetric capacitance, 10 times more compared to carbon, high gravimetric capacitance, three times higher than carbon. Uh, so these are very good results, but, but the point is that you end up with a voltage window which is only one volt or 1.1 volt, which is limited by obviously the water electrolysis. So if you want to design high energy density or increase the energy density of supercarbs or stuff like that, this is not very good. You need to move to non-aqueous electrolyte. But anyway, first what you see is that by using these muxines in sulfuric acid, you can now prepare a second kind of surface redox pseudocapacitive materials with this very nice cyclic voltammetry. But the key now is to try to make these muxines operating in non-aqueous electrolyte to increase the delta E, the potential window, and then the, the performance, I would say. So we failed for years, but uh, there are two exam I'm going to show you two examples of uh, uh, results we got, which are really promising and saying that, yes, we can make it and it may have an interesting uh, uh, impact into the uh, high power battery. Uh, community. So the first thing is that we, we prepared macroporous muxine electrolyte because we wanted to play with lithium intercalation from non aqueous electrolyte. Obviously, it's big, bigger ions and more viscous electrolyte. So we want to prepare macroporous muxine electrodes. We did it a very simple way. You mix uh, polystyrene uh, uh, spheres together with TI3C2. You make a filtration here. You see you have a uh, your electrode, and then you have dissolved by in acetone the PPS spheres, and you have these big poles. You press a little bit, and you end up with your macroporous TFC2 electrode. And then we use a salt, lithium TFSI, and we used three different solvents acetonitrile, DMSO, and PC. And these are the results we obtain. Uh, in blue and black, this is the cyclic voltammetry in acetonitrile and DMSO electrolyte. So you can see that we have a kind of a small capacity and uh, I would say blur electrochemical signature. However, when you use PC, you see that you have an opening here of a lithium of, a, of an electrochemical voltage window with lithium intercalation 
the intercalation and you have very decent cyclic voltammetry, you have a very good charge of 500 coulomb per gram, which is about 200 threads per gram, and you intercalate lithium from three, I mean, 2.6 down to 0.6 within two, 2.4 voltage window, which is one of the first time uh, we, we uh, uh, first, it was the first report of very decent electrochemical activity in non-acute selector light for mixins. But more, this is a counterintuitive selection of solvent because PC electrolyte has the lowest conductivity. And then we try to understand what was uh, happening in these uh, electrolytes. Uh, you see here that uh, this is a change of 0, 0, 2 peak during polarization, okay, by XRD. So we, we track the position of 0, 0, 2 by XRD, and what you see is that during insertion, deinsertion, there is no change in the 0, 0, 2 peak position. So means that there is no change in the despacing uh, uh, of the muxine when you put lithium in and out. Differently, in the other solvent, yes, there was a change. And more interesting is that by molecular dynamics modeling, we saw that the only way to get this high capacitance and to get this number of, of despacing was to put lithium more or less, mainly desolvated between the layers. So, and the message is that when you have lithium which are mainly dissolvated between the layers of muxine, then you improve the capacitance, you, are, you reach high capacity, high capacitance and fast redox processes. So it's, this solvation process seems to be quite uh, universal, I would say. And then <clears throat> if you go a bit further, you can see that you, if you, you have very nice, uh, 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 I would say, power performance into one volt per second. The, the, the peak current changes with a B. Uh, B1 means that uh, it changes with uh, a scan rate. It's non-diffusion limited. And finally, so it was the first time that we show high performance in non-acute selector life from vaccine. So I think I would have maybe 15 minutes more. I need 15, 10 minutes more. I apologize a little bit. Well, it's going to extend for one hour. Uh, now, uh, the next step and the last one example, last example I'm going to show you is uh, we try to, okay, the surface of muxines is, uh, contains surface groups coming from HF or fluorine content, fluorine electro, fluorine based electrolytes uh, needed to etch the aluminum layer. How can we prepare a, a, a muxine with different surface group? Because normally the surface is going to suppose to drive the electrochemical reactivity. To do that, we design a new method to prepare muxines based on molten salt groups. You take a copper chloride and you heat this copper chloride at 750 degrees C. It's liquid. Then you put your, max, your max phase, TI3 silicon, uh, TI3 SIC2. And silicon is going to be removed by oxidation into SiCl4 gas. And this silica, silica oxidation, silicon oxidation, sorry, is induced by the copper to plus reduction onto copper, into copper. So during this process, copper to plus reduced onto copper, into copper, onto the mixine, and you have a concomitant oxidation of silicon into silicon, uh, silicon plus four. And then after, uh, normally you have here your muxine prepared, but with copper. So that the second step is needed to wash, to oxidize this copper in APS, ammonium persulfate, to finally obtain the mux, the muxine. And as, as you can see here, we succeed in preparing exfoliated muxine materials. And the key point here is that there is no fluorine element, no fluor elements no fluorine uh, in this uh, electrolyte for preparing muxine from max. And the XRD is the same, oops, sorry, XRD is the same, and what you can see from the uh, ICP elemental analysis and elemental analysis uh, is that you end up with a composition of TI3C2 more or less with oxygen and chloride. No fluorine, no OH group onto the muxine surface. What is interesting with this method is that you can it, you can generalize it playing with the redox potential of the A, which is the Lewis acid, and the A element. So uh, we succeed in preparing uh, several uh, muxines uh, by, by, by this method. I'm going to skip that. But what is interesting as well is that uh, we try to, uh, to analyze the surface group composition of the muxine. So here on the left side, this is muxine prepared from HF. 
from zero to uh, 800 Celsius degrees. So we heat, we heat, we, we make a TGA, in fact, but at the same time, we have a mass spectros, uh, we have a mass spec and we can measure, we can uh, know uh, uh, what uh, gases are uh, emitted. And we can go back to the surface functional groups uh, present on the surface, depending on the uh, temperature of decomposition. So here, you see that on HF mixine, you have mainly water and OH groups. Here, this is our molten salt mixine. We still have water. However, there is no more OH. We have CO2, means that we oxidize a little bit of carbon. And obviously, if you go to the full spectra until uh, 1200 Celsius degree, you see that we have some, free, uh, some um, uh, chlorine and so on and so on evolving from the surface. This is a degradation of a mixine. And here you have a fluorine because you, uh, it's a HF mixine. So the message is that there is no OH groups on mixine. There is no F minus, I mean, no, fluor, no fluorine groups. And it's only oxygen and chlorine termination. And here I'm going to show you the electrochemistry in LIPF6 ECDMC electrolyte, which is lithium ion battery electrolyte. The electrochemical characterization of HF mixine, mixine prepared from HF exine, containing free run groups. You see that this is a very uh, a blurred electrochemical signature. You have very few redox peaks, and the lithium intercalation proceeds within. Free volt. So it's not a good anode, it's not a good cathode because the redox potential is, I mean, the operating voltage is too high. And you have a second shell lithium intercalation with several redox peaks again, but really not nice and interesting. Obviously, if you integrate with capacity over this whole potential range, you, you can reach high numbers to 200 milliampere per gram, but this does not make sense because the potential window is too large. And this is our CV obtained with fluorine-free muxines, chlorine terminated. You can see that we have a very symmetric cyclic voltammetry. We only, this is two, from, uh, from a two, two volt, two point, uh, two volt down to a point two volt. It's a two volt current for lithium intercalation. The average potential window is 1.2 volt for lithium intercalation, which is compatible with negative electrode. But here, you, you can see that you have a capacitive-like signature. And this is a power performance for HF etching muxine with 1.4 milligram per square centimeter. You can see that at 10C, you are below 70 milliampere per gram. And this is the same weight loading, fluorine free chlorine terminated muxine. And you can see that <clears throat> we can still deliver 75 milliampere per gram at 186C, which is really really high and this is here a high power negative electrode for a battery uh, a battery system so we can reach 200 milliampere per gram here at low current density <clears throat> 200 milliampere per gram and 100 milliampere per gram at 100 c and finally i told you last time i told you that in uh, uh, this is more or less the same experiment we did uh, uh, we tried the 002 peak position this is previous results and this is the new result in lp30 electrolyte you can see that we have a mean uh, interspace layer of distance of 11 amstrang which does not change that much as well so we can assume that lithium ions are mainly dissolvated between the layers and again when they are mainly dissolvated you have high capacity and you have capacitive like redox process so this is the conclusion uh, it means that we can by tuning the surface of the materials you can yes prepare materials with very high fast lithium ion calculation in discharge but also in charge and this is where we believe that there are now a lot of things to do not maybe only with these materials but this is a kind of uh, a new uh, opening, new opportunities for designing high power battery materials. And now for, for conclusion perspective, I would say that for the carbon-based supercaps, <clears throat> the goal is to increase the energy density. And you can do it by uh, controlling the pore size and the local structure ordering of the carbon, as I mentioned before, I gave examples. But there are also very interesting work in the literature. You can work on electrolytes with, uh, this is Andre Balducci, to design more stable electrolytes with larger Delta E. You can clean the carbon from surface groups, 
uh, and uh, uh, this is already efficient in the companies with the Maxwell Tesla companies uh, proposing free volt cells. And you can also prepare edge free carbon structures. This is a Cutanese group with very nice paper up to 4.4 volt and using noble carbons well, from Marcus Antonietti with very high stability. And I would say also a last uh, result that is going to be published soon. Uh, it's in press. You can develop SEI, solid electrolyte interface like layers onto porous carbon. This is a work of Marco Olarte. Sorry, there is a mistake here. And you can see from this paper from Olarte that when you, uh, this is a, a porous carbon in aqueous electrolyte without any uh, specific uh, thing. So one volt maximum. If you prepare, you code, you design a SEI, passive layer onto this porous carbon, you see, you extend the voltage window up to two volt. You lose a little bit capacitance, but you can increase largely the voltage range. And this is a, definitely, to my opinion, a way to go. But supercaps, carbon-based supercaps, they have, will have lower, obviously, energy density given that is always, but high power, high cyclability. And now, if you have a look to <coughs> the battery side, you can increase the power density of batteries by designing uh, electrical architectures like Brisbane show in, uh, in science by making some nanoporous uh, electrodes with super high rate, even at super high loading, weight loading. You can also play with a material structure and prepare defective amorphous lithium and phosphate. This is work from Naoi. There are also very super work from uh, Mascolier uh, in, uh, in NRCS in Amiens, uh, where, which shows that by tuning the, the defects uh, on LFP, you can increase the kinetics of the uh, uh, redox reactions. And what is interesting uh, from this work from Naoui is that this sloping discharge or char charge or discharge profile is due to the defective LFP. So you can also change the electrochemical signature. And then there is this work, uh, both mixing uh, and organic electrolyte. There's also the, all the metal oxide and the work from Veronica Augustine, Bruce Dance on W3 and nb 5 So there are a lot of things which are currently ongoing. And the message is that <clears throat> there are a lot of opportunities to develop, a, 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 I would say, the shared knowledge fundamental that will be uh, uh, taken by both technologies and more important, to my opinion, high power batteries and I will say solo capacitive super caps or high redox, high rate redox capacitive materials will uh, are really converging now. And I think that uh, in a couple of years, we'll talk about high power batteries, which are highly needed for even for mobility. And then I would like to uh, thank all my my uh, my colleagues. This is not only my work, obviously, the work of uh, a lot of people, uh, Pierre Vitaberna, uh, Barbara Lafosse, Patrick Rosier, Céline Erlé, and a lot of students. Uh, um, there's no no time to thank all of them. And obviously, I would like to thank you all for your for your very kind attention. And uh, uh, thank you a lot again for the invitation. I hope that I was not too long. Thanks a lot. Very much, Patrice. Um, let's go for questions. Um, let's say here. Oh, is it in the private chat? Um, so the first question is: You can re read this. Uh, yes, is um, from Jean Pedro Aguiar, our master student. Uh, I would like to to talk a little bit more about abnormal increase on the capacitance since when the ion lose part of its solventing solvent yeah solvent. <laughs> so i did not i did not uh, spend a lot of time on that because uh, uh it's all result now but yeah we, what we call it abnormal uh, 15 years ago because when we uh, when we found it it was a bit uh, uh difficult to explain but since that time a lot of people have been uh, uh, explained even by modeling what happens. Yeah, you you strip, you remove a part of a solvation shell. I tried to explain that also in my talk, so that when you have an ion which is uh, with, with a solvent molecules, the approaching distance is, is given, but when you remove a part of a solvation shell, you can get closer to uh, of the surface, and then you decrease the approaching distance, and then you increase the capacitance. And we believe also that this partial dissolvation uh, leads to, a, 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 I would say, a par partial charge transfer from the carbon to the ions, or from the ion to the carbon, sorry. And then this is why you have this kind of capacitance increase. But again, abnormal was 15 years ago. Now it's more or less uh, 
something which has been uh, well uh, identified, and this is obviously due to desolvation and partial desolvation. And somehow this uh, this uh, this uh, charge transfer increase a lot the capacitance, but all but also have the issue with the diffusion, right? So yeah, uh, surprisingly, these uh, super caps are still super high power, and there are a lot of papers from modeling saying that yes, the diffusion coefficient in porous nanoporous carbon is less than in the bulk electrolyte, definitely, but surprisingly, surprisingly faster than. Uh, expectations. So this is also because when electrolytes are confined in these pores, the, the pores are in pieces of sponge. Okay, so you have small pores, but close to two small, two small pores, or a pore maybe a little bit larger, and then everything, all the pores are connected. So it is not that super difficult from an ion to move uh, from a, a, a place to, 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 to another place. Yeah, that's good. So let's move for, to another one. Um, Maybe you can read this. So maybe I'll okay, just yeah. the expectation. So I try to explain that. It's uh, something, you have all the details in the paper. This is a transfer. Uh, the SLG is grown on copper substrate. Then you put a PET film on, onto it by pressing. You dissolve the copper. So that after that, you end up with PET with the graphene onto it. And then you have your gold quartz, sorry, the, is there. the, quartz, uh, the gold quartz, and you press the PET onto it. And then you put acet you, you dissolve in organic uh, solvent, you have a PT, and then you end up with your SLG coated onto the gold quartz. So and you, you protect and then you, you dissolve yeah, the, uh, the. Exactly. Protection. Exactly. That's good. And, and obviously, we repeated the, the experiment with several SLG and several quartz to confirm that it was more or less the same behavior. Similar results be obtained with spin or drop coating for carbon powders, yes, but not for graphene, obviously, because graphene needs to be transferred. Single layer graphene needs to be uh, transferred. Yeah. Um. An example of. Uh, mm. So if you go to very slow scan rate, you favor the diffusion uh, limited process versus the capacitive behavior. So yes, you're right in a way, but there is a limitation. And this limitation is more or less the leakage current of the re parasitic redox reactions, which are linked with, for instance, uh, oxidant reduction, which are linked with electrolyte oxidation at the extreme uh, extreme part of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of the CV. So that yes, decreasing the potential scan rate is a way to favor uh, the diffusion limited reaction versus capacitive reactions. But again, uh, it's quite difficult, even at super slow scan rate, to make to differentiate the contributions. And you lose the power, so you want to increase the power. <laughs> and and you can you can use uh, uh, the Trasati method uh, because the Professor Trasati who passed away a couple of months ago uh, used uh, uh, design a very nice method to uh, extrapolate to super low or super high scan rate. Well, the next next question, please. That's it. Is that? I can make a question if uh, if you allow me. Um, uh, most of the research are recent on the area. For example, in Brazil, all around the world, and uh, there's no infrastructure, and they want to work with aqueous electrolyte. And you show that's a, 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 a terrible uh, issue we have in aqueous because. We have the, the work window voltage is very low, so the electrochemical stability is no far from one point, let's say, yep. six if we have, let's say, a neutral electrolyte or something like that. And uh, we can go much further on this. But this this guy is that presenting the wise electrolyte or water and salt electrolyte, which is fancy in a way that uh, we can uh, block in the, the, um, uh, the water oxidation reduction, water splitting, by um, um, putting a, a, a layer of salt on the front of the electrode. And uh, uh, how, how do you see this as, a, for example, uh, I don't know if your group have worked on this. Uh, if you reach the working voltage, people say it's like three volts or something like that. And uh, it, if you think that a way to, be, uh, uh, to use water, which is much easier to handle, uh, electrolyte in a sense uh, of, uh, uh, let's say, um, 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 
uh, advice that you can purchase in the future, let's say, in the industrial level? I, I would say that uh, I'm not really confident for wise electrolytes in uh, porous uh, materials because uh, wise electrolytes, uh, they have, uh, yeah, in a way you can extend the, the potential window, but they have, uh, uh, I would say, the conductivity uh, is an issue for porous materials and as well as viscosity and so on. So, so far, all the results we got in uh, nanoporous carbons means that you decrease sharply the capacitance and you increase obviously uh, a bit voltage window but uh, um, I would say that this is not really satisfactory from this point of view because the kinetics electrochemical kinetics are too low in these wise electrolytes for high power uh, I would say uh, devices like supercaps in porous carbons however this is why I mentioned the, uh, in the last slide I mentioned this this uh, uh, artificial solid electrolyte interface approach. I'm more confident in designing some uh, SEI layers onto carbons, passive layers onto the external surface of carbon particles so that you block the solvent. Basically, you, uh, you design a hydrophobic interface mm -hmm. conducting to the ions, but which does not allow uh, aqueous electrolytes, solvent, I mean, water to get in touch with the carbon so that you avoid the electro electrochemical activity of water. So, a uh, hydrophobic interface layer in hydrophilic electrolytes, so hydrophobic in aqueous electrolyte, allows for extending the voltage window of the uh, of, uh, of, uh, operating voltage window, and the capacitance loss is not that high. And I'm pretty sure that it should be super interesting. Yeah, yeah, that's that's work the same way in a some level that we form a, a layer to avoid yeah. it. And, uh, uh, of course, you change in this way. In this the, the way you said, we, we change the local um, um, electric uh, dielectric electric dielectric in the, in the local field. This this mm -hmm. one more question uh, uh, about the intercalation process. Uh, I don't know if you said in the presentation, for example. There's some kind of metal size, for example, that you can uh, uh, have like a, a path very high for for uh, the lithium ion, for example, go very quickly. And some research say call this diffusionless um, uh, um, type of, um, for example, niobium pentoxide. We have a lot of this, uh, this kind of material here in Brazil. For example, there's a huge miner and, and uh, some. Um, motivations to us work with this kind of material what have you guys work with that have an uh, experience uh, and uh, feel, feel that's the same way we think that's yeah. uh, very good mature i would say that we did uh, a paper together with uh, bruce dunn and Vero augustine in 2013 in nature materials on uh, niobium pentoxide which was the first example of super fast lithium intercalation in, uh, in oxides, I will say that yes, this is uh, interesting, but you should only, um, you, need, you need a structure which is well suited for super fast lithium transportation. This is the key. Uh, this is why I believe that this, this is obviously super interesting and this has to be uh, developed. And again, we, we need a lot of, I mean, we need a, a couple of papers with Bruce Dunn's group uh, uh, on this niobium oxide uh, and with Laurent Pilon and so on. So yes, this is definitely a way to uh, to increase the power. Uh, why I was mentioning about the two D materials is that two D materials with under advanced gaps they are more or less flexible. You can you can tune this with two D layer depending on what you put in and depending on the interactions between the structure and the solvent, so that you can dissolvate or not. And this is more. Uh, I would say it offers more opportunities compared to a solid rigid structure where you only have these channels for fast lithium diffusion, but you cannot really uh, tune more or less the, the, uh, the distance, you see. So I would say that to, 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 make, uh, to make a short answer, yes, the nobium pentoxide and over like a molybdenum oxide and so on are very important, but you need a, uh, you need a, a specific structure for that with very fast lithium diffusion channels. Uh, but on the other hand, these two D materials, the Van der Gap, uh, uh, gaps are very interesting as well and may offer more opportunities for that. Uh, uh, my question was in the direction, for example, when we make ink or a slurry with this material, when we go for more from the fundamental to more in a, in a production level, 
where we want to make row to row process. And uh, I have some issues when I look the, 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 the 2D materials together. I don't know if the, the, the binder, for example, are going to fulfill all these gaps you have between this. Uh, there's a huge uh, uh, poros between the, the, the studio materials. Have you guys have any experience uh, preparing this ink and uh, painting uh, yeah. much like that? Yeah, keep in mind that for these 2D materials, they are not fully delaminated. Eh? These are grains. The one I show you, uh, we've prepared for molten salt. These are grains of about 10 to 15 micron, okay, which are exfoliated, like accordion-like. So this is why you can easily bound these grains and particles using a binder. We use PTFE because we don't go that um, to, to, to too, much, too low negative potential. We stop at 0.2 volt. But you can use PVDF as well, and we did use PVDF as well for preparing the slurries in a very conventional way. Uh, I will say that the electrodes we prepared uh, for mixines in aqueous electrolyte were filtered. So, yeah, I, I agree with you in that case, it's not really convenient. But the ones, uh, the other ones are really uh, conventionally casted using a binder plus uh, carbon black mixture. Well, thank you very much. Uh, next question, Professor Rubens. Hello. Hello, Patrice. Congratulations for a very nice, very thank nice talk. Me. Uh, I'd like you to know how difficult it is to um, control the pore size control um, when you manufacture your emixin, especially yeah. when you want to focus on micropores. Yeah, so uh, the macropores muxine electrode, in fact, it was not that difficult to control. The I was a bit fast because I knew I was uh, I was, uh, I was was running out of time. So uh, we use, simply use polystyrene spheres, 200 nanometers, as hard pump plate. So you mix everything, you press, and then you dissolve the hard PPS spheres, and then you have your pores, very big pores. For the other muxines, we don't really control the, uh, the porosity because we... Uh, we I would say that we, delamine, no, we exfoliate the mixine and then we measure by XRD a mean D002 uh, spacing, interlayer distance, I would say. So, uh, by, but what is interesting is that depending on uh, the surface group, you can finally see how your D spacing changes during lithium intercalation or deintercalation. And this is driven mainly by the surface groups. And this is also... Uh, yeah, mainly by the surface group, the, the nature of the surface group. And this is why we think there are a lot of things now to do by understanding why with fluorine you have as low uh, uh, electrochemical activity in non aqueous electrolyte with, with lithium ion containing, why with chlorine it's much better, and we have all the results with uh, iodine and uh, bromide and so on. So this seems interesting. It's more fundamental study. Okay, thanks very much, Patrice. Thanks a lot for your day. Thanks a lot for your nice comments. Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, do we do we have any other questions? So, thank you, uh, Patrice Simon, for your time and for uh, it's, it's very uh, it's very pleasure to hear from you. Uh, all the developments and all the things you think that is exciting. Uh, you have many followers here in Brazil. Uh, our our students, quite a lot of students here in our group, as Juarez said before the, the, the meeting starts. So in the uh, ACS division, yeah. energy storage um, division, where we are, Professor Huber is the, the, the PI from our division. We have about uh, uh, 60 students and, and some uh, adjunct students as well. And uh, yeah. this, people are always looking for uh, the great developments you guys do. And it's very nice to hear uh, your perspective and uh, have opportunity to talk to you and to shout to you and uh, hopefully next time uh, we can exchange students and maybe have a work together in the close future. I so, will be pleased to and, and, and remember we need to define a, uh, to, to define a date in September to try to uh, organize a meeting all together between our two groups to see what we can do all together and uh, Maybe uh, when everything will be better, I will be pleased to visit uh, Brazil. One even knows we will see that. Hopefully soon. Thank okay. you very much once again. Thanks a lot for the very kind invitation. Thank you. Thank you. It was my good pleasure. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Thank you.